so this uh, can be useful for, for all of us. The second, uh, I understand also that the, that, that preference is uh, a nice one since there are also <coughs> evaluation mechanisms through the annual report which has to be done by each country and also presented to you the United Nations group on the human rights uh, assessment. So I understand that, but uh, I would say that the most probably the time is less arrogant than it was at the, after the Second World War to rewrite something or to include in, uh, in the a human declaration, in the human, a new human or with amendments or whatever you may, you may think about. Uh, I would say, well, that is a question for me. I am tolerable of doing that, but at the same time, there are difficulties. Uh, and I am wondering if we don't have to uh, diversify our sources of rights, just to include in those diversified rights, you know, uh, what we think internet is bringing in the scope today. Uh, well, I am mentioning three examples that are already quoted. The declaration of the child protection is something which is a good tool, you know. Why to include that again in the human rights declaration and not to expose a bit more that uh, worldwide declaration of child protection? The question of access of knowledge, I would say, uh, it is interesting, of course, but at the same time, I think that the battle is not, is not there. The battle is at the, the level of the white room. So if we don't attack that fortress, you know, we will not change anything. Actually, currently, there is strong position between those who are the owners of the knowledge, you know, and the other ones. Look at the question of the trademarks and all those things. You know. And I think if we want to defend question of the uh, knowledge for all, we have to, to think some new ways of making this direction. Third one, <laughs> about privacy. We know that it's already covered by the Article 12 of the United Nations Declaration, Human Rights Declaration, but it is only one article where, whereas, you know, the European uh, Directive has how many articles, to, I don't remember, uh, Stefano, how many articles in the world is keeping? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, you know, there's something like 40 articles as, as far as I remember. <coughs> Ralph, you may say, how many? I don't know. Something like that? <coughs> well, so I, uh, you can put in one article right. something which, is, which needs, you know, some more articles just to be specified in some very specific case. So I would say let us diversify the sources of rights. And I think the, the intention of the Bill of Rights is to have a kind of platform with all those declarations which are widely accepted, you know, and on which we can go further and work on it to just specify in those declarations or in those instruments what is needed to be. Let's merge the rights which are really needed in our society like the right of access, like the right even of the infrastructure, you know. The ownership of the infrastructure is something which is so critical. So all those questions that we are discussing now for the third time in this IGF must find some issues more comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Jerry, I just wanted to say some when you spoke about like the development, Sean spoke about like the communication. And when the, the document was written, there was no internet, obviously. So the word internet doesn't figure that. But if you look at today's world, ask yourself the question, is the right to development, right to education, right to communication at all possible without having ability to access it? Right? My answer is, it's not possible. You can't have an educated world, you can't have a world where communication rights are actually possible, or development is possible without internet connectivity to everybody. And that's why I use the phrase, right to internet, I don't think, I agree with Sean, we should not think of it as a new right, but it is a reinterpretation of the same document in the context of today's world, because the internet was not there when this document was written. And I want to draw, link it to what Andrew said, uh, see all the dynamic coalitions that had one significant problem, which is that there's no traction. And I think some gentlemen here said that it's because the UN is not here, it's because the governments are not here, and that's a problem sort of common to many dynamic coalitions. I want to make two comments on that. 
First is that uh, I think the issue of next billion and last billion is very important. <coughs> there are one billion people connected to the net for their marketing mindset, freedom of expression. Those are very overriding kind of critical issues. But what about six billion who are not even connected? So so long as they're not they're not connected, the issue of freedom of expression is entirely irrelevant to them. And I think if there if at all there is a prioritization, it's very important that how do we in the internet governance forum, how do we as a as a <coughs> global uh, governance group? A body that's discussing that bring to light the whole issue of inclusion and people centeredness that the Geneva Declaration of Principles talks about. <coughs> and unless we therefore recognize ability to access the internet as a fundamental right that everybody must have, I think the other debates will not acquire traction. Particularly of development, uh, developing countries, governments, developing countries, people, five fifths of humanity is not going to be in this whole issue. So if this particular coalition of coalitions wants to bring right to the center case, I think it's very important that we get the developing countries in developing country governments in, and I think looking at right to connectivity, right to access, right to knowledge, education, which subsume the right to internet is something that you think will help us move forward, we should move forward on that. <coughs> Just wanted to say that tomorrow at 11.30 in room 3, there's a workshop on internet for all, exploring a rights-based perspective. We have uh, Radhika Lal from UNDP as one of the speakers in that, we have government of India speaker on that. So I think some of these debates that we're having in terms of uh, thickening or reinterpreting of rights in today's world, I think maybe we can have some more discussions on that tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, um, they can ride because they do see this as an extremely important issue for them. So, and Liz is going to essentially speak on behalf of the Council of Europe. Thanks, but um, he's going to follow on the transcript um, later. And so, apologies in advance to me if I misrepresent him. I just had a quick phone call with him and he made some very rough notes from what he said. So, this um, in no means is a, a statement from the Council of Europe, it's just some rough jottings that I've taken down from a little very short conversation with Liz. So, um, firstly, he said that uh, the Council of Europe have actually been working on these issues, been trying to mainstream human rights in the IGF since the inception of the IGF. He very wanted to emphasize that this is something that the Council of Europe has been trying to do. Um, however, he does say that if we start talking about human rights um, in this kind of context, it's often not tangible what exactly we mean to many of the stakeholders that we're talking to. Um, communities don't necessarily have an understanding of, for example, what exactly the right to privacy means in this context. Um, so that's something we need to form, focus on. It's um, trying to really work out exactly what human rights mean in the context of the internet. Um, and so he says that this, this actually involves talking at a, a number of different levels, a number of different layers in the, in the communications environment. Um, from the technical level, physical level, we're talking about rules, we're talking about policy making. <coughs> so these kind of conversations are very important at all these different levels within the IDF. Um, the, the Council of Europe have also been working um, looking at this, these issues from the perspective of uh, the public service value of the internet. And they really see this as a roadmap to guide us through many of these different issues that we've been working on, that we've been discussing today, a real blueprint. Um, another angle they've also been taking is to develop guidelines. Um, so these are, for example, they've got guidelines on how ISPs should approach human rights issues. Um, and this is all about raising awareness about the fact that we, we do all have values. We don't need to necessarily create them, but it's raising awareness about what those values are. And um, yeah. Uh, so in, in that work, the ISPs have been involved um, with, with the Council of Europe. So it's important to emphasize that not just the states working on this, we really need to bring uh, the private sector, etc. You know, the people that we're trying to talk to, the people that are involved, the direct stakeholders, need to be involved in these discussions. Um, and this demonstrates, you know, industry really does want to do more on, on these issues. It's really all about cooperation. So these um, final two, two, um, two finishing points that he wanted to highlight, so one, it's about raising awareness, and they, he feels that they need a lot more stakes involved in this discussion, and they need to open it out. Um, and um, that it's important in that discussion to have the right people from the right ministries in terms of government stakeholders involved in that discussion. So, um, it's, and secondly, uh, from that, following on from that point, um, you can't just talk to media representatives in government, or you can't just talk to the telecommunications um, representatives in government. It really needs to be both people from both of those different kind of stakeholder groups, because otherwise these ideas, these discussions really aren't going to be rolling, really aren't going to get off the ground. Um, in this environment, uh, the media and the telecommunications are very much overlapping. So it's about getting the right um, people involved in the conversations as well. So again, uh, apologies to me if I really didn't touch upon the points that he wanted to, or if I misrepresented him in any way. 
I guess my suggestion would be for people to join the mailing list of the Internet Bill of Rights Dynamic Coalition, and then we could maybe uh, carry this discussion on, yeah. clear up any points, and clarify any errors that I've made, and, and you guys can carry on the, the conversation with him there as well. So that would be my suggestion. A number of issues. We'll try and just maximise as soon as to try and summarise where we've got to in the conversation so far, but it is going to carry on. You will get an opportunity to carry on the discussion and debate. Hello, my name is Cynthia Waddell, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Center for Disability Resources. I'm also a lecturer in law in disability rights at Santa Clara University, um, and have, wear another hat as an ICT accessibility and government services expert for the United, United Nations Global Initiative for Inclusive ICT. We're talking today about maintaining human rights in the work of, of IGF. I think the earlier comment that you start with what the existing rights is, is uh, imperative. And so I'm going to give an example of existing rights. Did you know the most recent convention on rights to persons with disability has specific targeted language that uh, uh, addresses access to the internet? We actually have in the convention on rights to persons with disabilities in Article 9 uh, a, 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 a state party's obligation to promote access for persons with disabilities to new information and communication technology systems, including the internet. Many of you may not be aware that even if a person with disability is connected, they may still not be able to access the content on the internet. And so the disability community, of which there are 650 million in the world, uh, there are many of us out there, uh, the majority of persons with disabilities are in developing countries. And they're very concerned about the investment of internet in their country to ensure that even if that structure is there and people are connected, that they also have access. I'll only refer to another point in the convention, uh, requires uh, state parties to have an obligation to promote the design, development, production, and distribution of accessible ICT in, at an early stage. Um, and this includes accessible design of the internet. So I think as we see conventions as they move forward articulating uh, obligations of state parties uh, governing the internet, um, you might, it would be an important thing to map out what is out there. I will also say that we are moving towards a period of uh, monitoring now where the model is that NGOs or persons with disabilities will be focal points in the country reports to the committee that is the monitoring committee of persons with disabilities at the human rights uh, tribunal level. Uh, so uh, that is something that is a implementation step to try to foster mainstreaming of the disability perspective within government. So with respect to mainstreaming human rights, uh, at a global level, we've talked about many uh, rights. We really need to map out what has <coughs> been articulated, agree on what those rights are. Uh, before you can move forward to any implementation for mainstreaming. Uh, and last point, as part of the implementation for the UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, I am editor and as many others in co-authoring a, for ITU, uh, the uh, uh, e-accessibility online toolkit for policymakers on how to implement this because of the lack of education awareness on accessibility for persons with disabilities. And I suspect there may be a lack of awareness and education on many of these other human rights issues that are already articulated in, in declarations that perhaps as we tra transfer or translate that right to its application in internet governance, we need to further take a look at that because if you are not able to do that, you will not be able to mainstream. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's an obligation for someone else. Um, and uh, I think at the moment, the UN Declaration of Human Rights um, creates obligations for states uh, to create the right mechanisms for, uh, for the people of the country to uh, be protected. And I think what's uh, a good summary is uh, the John Raji report. Um, and for business, that's a, a quite interesting uh, report. John Raji was uh, tasked to look at uh, what are the business obligations uh, with regard to human rights. And uh, he clearly outlined that uh, those human rights, first of all, they are 
binding on states because signatories to the Declaration are, are states. Um, and so they have the primary obligation to protect their citizens. Um, however, there are secondary sort of obligations, and in a way, the uh, obligations for businesses are to respect uh, these human rights. So they're not, uh, they don't have the primary obligation uh, to protect the citizens, that's the obligation of the state, but to respect these rights. And um, we have an example in, in Germany where the, the lawmakers uh, found it necessary to translate some of these human rights, uh, the right to non-discrimination, into a non-discrimination law. Now that then again is, is different, because then the law of the country is binding upon everyone in the country, and especially on businesses. So there are different ways of doing that. Um, uh, then I think uh, what I heard here is quite unspecific on a very high intellectual level. Uh, the business we are quite often not as intellectual, um, but more on the practical level. And I think, if, uh, I think the discussion would benefit from very specific examples. And I like the examples that I heard from the, the lady talking about uh, women's rights and uh, um, rights to sexual self-determination and so on. I found something um, quite disturbing. I, I'm not sure where it was, whether it was MySpace or Facebook or some social networking site where women were talking about breastfeeding. And I know, because my wife, uh, we, we were recent parents, our son is a year and a half old now, and we looked at World Health Organization recommendations on breastfeeding, and they say you should really do it quite long, six months exclusively, and uh, a year or even longer uh, co-breastfeeding. Co so, and there was a, I know that the World Health Organization has put out recommendations very strongly and has asked for every country uh, to set up specific commissions to encourage that women go breastfeeding. And so it would be only natural that you have a web to all website where women talk about how to breastfeed and their experiences and all. Now, I don't know exactly which social networking site it was, but wherever breast was there, or picture with the, with the image of a woman uh, bearing her breast for breastfeeding her child, that was deleted. And I think here we're talking very practical, down to earth, what this means on the internet in practice. And I think uh, that also ties into the discussion um, on child protection uh, and the internet. And I think it's, I'm very concerned personally, I'm not speaking as a, as a, as a company representative here, but as someone who's been on the internet for 18 years now. Uh, I'm very concerned about uh, governments being able to use an excuse, uh, we are protecting children or we're protecting something else as a means to introduce sophisticated filtering software and, 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 and reducing uh, the ability of citizens to access information or to exchange information as the example of the breastfeeding bonus uh, shows. I, I think I'm very concerned and this is very practical. I would rather talk more about practical applications than about sort of the, the high clouds of uh, principles and so on. So. Okay, thank you. Um, um, secondly, I think it's been emphasised it's important that the work of the coalition is embraces all all of the human rights, not just a, a constituency around free expression or privacy, but around women, around children, around disability. So there's a comprehensive approach to how the right is approached within the coalition. Thirdly, in terms of engaging government business, I think you heard both the need to have very practical, focused discussions with those constituencies, but also discussions that are maybe focused on values. And we have to think about the representational problem that government and business has in these forums. I mean, the Global Network Initiative, which I think Wolfgang referred to, which is a business civil society initiative, is entirely private, publishes no transcripts, does not reveal the recording of its discussions because the business people, uh, that's the only way they are free to explore the kind of issues and concerns that get raised if they're guaranteed that kind of confidentiality. So. This environment may not be the best one to have certain kinds of discussions with certain groups. We may need to think about forums between the IGF that keep the dynamic coalition going. So that's really, that's what I've got out of part one of the conversation and we're handing over to you for part two. Thank you, Tom, and understand the need. Sorry, very, 
to understand the needs and interests of the dynamic coalitions in 